Coming up on Theater Talk. The king is not paying Shakespeare to perform for him? How's... You don't pay a lot. I don't know how much Obama pays when you come to the White House, but <laughs> you know, not... it may be expenses. They may send a limo. That's the uh, Jacobean equivalent. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. We have our favorite Shakespearean scholar here. He well, he's be... not my favorite because my favorite is my husband. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite but... and her second <laughs> You're favorite. You're my second. I'm happy <laughs> to be second. Are you happy to be second? <laughs> Very uh, James Shapiro, who uh, has written uh, a number of extraordinary books about Shakespeare and his plays. His latest book is The Year of Lear. Shakespeare in 1606, out from Simon & Schuster. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Uh, it's great to be back. Good. Um, all right, so what I love about your books, uh, 1599, another book where you write about Hamlet, and this you write about Lear and Macbeth and Antony and Cleopatra. What is going on in Shakespeare's life that inspires him or drives him to write these plays at this particular time? We like to think of Shakespeare as writing two plays a year, steadily churning out hit after hit, like every writer, he had good years and bad years. Mm -hmm. And he had had a stretch of pretty bad years since Hamlet at the turn of the century. He had it flops. You know, he's struggling to find his footing under a new regime after Queen Elizabeth dies in 1603. And I'm sure the young bucks of the Elizabethan and Jacobean theater were saying, he's washed up. You know, he's the Neil Simon of his day. <laughs> right. Yeah, he was great then, but he keeps churning out those comedies that are past sale by date. And uh, in 1606, which turned out to be a terrible year in England, mm -hmm. Shakespeare finds his stride and knocks out three of the greatest Great tragedies in the language. Yeah. And what's going on in England? We've got, we've got the new regime, King James I, replacing someone that I always get the sense from your books, Shakespeare really, really liked a lot, Elizabeth I. I think Shakespeare did like Elizabeth. One of the, the nice things about becoming a playwright during the last year of a childless queen's reign mm -hmm. is you get to knock out succession play after succession play. Who's going to be the new ruler in Titus? Who's going to rule at the end of Hamlet? <laughs> oh, right, know, Shakespeare right. feasted on that story. <laughs> right, right. And King James comes in. He's got two sons and a daughter. That story's over. I mean, it's good for Shakespeare that one of the first things King James does when he comes into England is looks at Shakespeare's company, sees that it's the best one of the land, and says, you are the king's men. Right. Mixed blessing means you play court all, all the time. Mm -hmm. The downside is you're playing at court all the time instead of making money at the Globe. Right, because oh, that's because the king is not paying Shakespeare to perform that's, for him? You, know, you don't pay a lot. I don't know how much Obama pays when you come to the White House, but <laughs> you know, it may be expenses. They may send a limo. That's the uh, Jacobean equivalent. <laughs> we have a new regime, but we also have um, a plague raging in the city at this Pla time. Plague had struck England in 1603, the same year that Elizabeth died and King James came in and swept away one out of seven paying customers, so to speak, at the yeah. club. It just devastated London. And it came back in 1606 and ended up closing the theater the yeah. in, in late summer and, and early fall. But two other things happened that were worse. One was uh, the fallout from the gunpowder plot. Mm -hmm. And, and tell us about that. Since. Sure. In November, early November of 1605, a group of disaffected Catholic gentry decided, we want regime change. We want to restore the old faith. Let's kill King James, blow up Parliament, eliminate the ruling class, the religious leaders, the political leaders in one terrific explosion. And they were caught at the last minute. And the first few months of 1606 were spent in a kind of public spectacle that probably pulled people out of the theaters into the street because these individuals were dismembered, hanged for a bit. This was the Cut entertainment people. of the day. People flocked to see that stuff. And led to Guy Fawkes Day. And led to, we now think of it as Guy Fawkes Day, but in those days, 
Every Catholic was suspected at this point. Are they fifth columnists? Who's to be trusted? Do we take away children from Catholics and raise them in Protestant households? So there was real turmoil. In 1606, we're in a period like now where there's religious conflict. Uh, 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 and you, you have a king who believes in witches, and yet all these competing religions which lead to Shakespeare's place in a way. All this stuff feeds right into Shakespeare's work. Yes. You know, King James also, since he was a Scot, wanted to unite England and Scotland. He couldn't be king of two nations. He said, it's like being a bigamist. Right. And he's standing before Parliament and saying, I can't be married to two wives. <laughs> Let's just unite. Right. And what he did was create an identity crisis where there wasn't one. Yes, people didn't want to unite. And Shakespeare must have been thinking, thank God, because <laughs> I specialize in identity crises. <laughs> and this was just made to order. I'll knock out King Lear. <laughs> I'll do this Scottish play of Macbeth. Uh, yes. Uh, so he, you know, as bad as it got for England, it got much better for Shakespeare. So for, so for King Lear, which is about a man who's got to divide up his kingdom, this is ripped from the headlines of the day in, in some ways. It's a brilliant play. And most people don't know it, but there had been a play of King Lear that had been on the stage for 15 years. Right. And it was just published in the summer of 1605. Different spelling, though. L-E-I-R. L -E right. But well, he, he was really kind of ripping it off. It was <laughs> he was absolutely, you know, if there were lawyers and <laughs> right, right. You know, copyrights. You don't want to go there. <laughs> right. So he reads this whole play, which wonderfully has the king and his three daughters and a happy ending. Yes. Yeah. King Lear is restored to his daughter Cordella. Everybody's alive at the end. Thank God. So what Shakespeare does is take this story and turn it into the bleakest, most tragic story imaginable. If you two had seen the old play Lear and said, oh, let's go see Shakespeare's version, and you're expecting that happy ending, mm -hmm. it's like watching everybody hit by a truck in Act 5. <laughs> People must have been holding their heads. No one has ever before or since taken as happy an ending and turned it into as dark a tragedy as King Lear. And it really spoke to the time. So he's taking an Elizabethan play and doing a gut renovation and turning it into a Jacobean one. And that's, Shakespeare didn't make up plots. He saw what others didn't do really well, saw the potential of old plays that were out of fashion and figured out, okay, this is my chance. This is how I'm going to turn it and make this thing live again. Now, the third play uh, you deal with is Anthony and Cleopatra. And what is behind that? What is what's on Shakespeare's mind when he decides to write that story? James, King James, had been in power for three years. And he was this virile king, liked hunting, didn't like governing very much, mm -hmm. liked spending money, bankrupting the country. <laughs> he kind of realized soon that... Uh, it's not Christmas every day, as he put it. I understand that. <laughs> and when Elizabeth was aging, uh, people were just tired, as they said, of the old woman. They wanted to be governed by a guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hillary, I hope, is listening as we speak. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that happened was three years into the reign of King James, who was clearly going to live for a while, they realized this guy is not the one we wanted. And there were no elections back then every four years. You were stuck with a king until the day he died. And Anthony Cleopatra, which celebrates this great queen, uh, is a story in a lot of ways that speaks to, it's not just Shakespeare, everybody, Decker, others, playwrights at the time, are writing nostalgia for the old, the old lady. The old lady. We <laughs> wish we had her back. Now, this King James, is he aware? I mean, I guess we don't know, but do you think he's watching this play and thinking, what's Shakespeare really saying about me here? Or is he, ah, it's fun and Cleopatra's cute? <laughs> J James was probably the smartest person and the, the most best-selling author ever to rule in England. Yeah, the Bible. <laughs> and one of the, the, the really great things that he did this year was he wanted the spot in Westminster Abbey where Queen Elizabeth had herself buried in the tomb of her grandfather, Henry VII. So he ordered her dug up and dumped into this side area where all these virgin queens, including two of his own princess right. virgin daughters who died, were placed and he reserved that spot for himself. So he's playing his own little game about who is supplanting and who is replacing Elizabeth. What happened audience to Queen Elizabeth? Too, you know what happened to her? What? She got, she and her sister Mary was a Catholic, never know, quite yeah, got they, along. They, yeah. they dumped her bones on Mary's, planted this tomb on top, 
King James had this really tongue-in-cheek little Latin plaque said, you know, uh, they're happy together with posterity. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Have they fixed that? Have they fixed that? That's the way it it's is. It's still there. Day. <laughs> and the King James is still... And he <laughs> is, he took her spot. So it's all about rewriting yeah. history. Right. Shakespeare's right. doing it. King James is doing it. They're involved in kind of parallel projects. But Shakespeare, I always thought, a very canny operator because he does manage to survive regimes. He is slick. <laughs> he writes a play like Macbeth and gives King James a cameo in the middle of it, right. even though it's a play about the killing of a Scottish king. Right, right. So these plays always cut two ways. And I'm sure King James and everybody else who thought about these plays politically left the theater scratching heads. I have to ask you one more essential question. Why does the fool disappear in the middle of King Lear? That's a great question. Is there a practical, dramaturgical reason? There isn't, and that's what's so amazing. Ordinarily, when a character disappears, it's because the character is doubled. But Robert Armin played the fool, and he did not play Cordelia, <laughs> even though we love, and, and in some modern productions, you, know, you can get away with doubling those parts. The best answer I can give, and it's the kind of answer that somebody who has been teaching for 30 years gets away with answering, <laughs> yes. and you'll, you'll leave your head scratching, uh, scratching your head, you'll leave here. Um, the lessons of the fool to King Lear about his kingdom and how badly he has mismanaged his relationship to his nation and his daughter is absorbed by Lear at that point in the play. And Lear doesn't need the fool to rub it in. So the fool disappears. In a lot of ways, if you look structurally at King Lear, it's not a great play. And that's why we haven't seen really great productions of it. It's a handful. It's really hard to wrestle into shape. When Shakespeare did that gut renovation of that old play, mm -hmm. there were things in it that he couldn't quite wrestle into shape. The war in France, all this kind of stuff that didn't quite work. The beginning works great, the end works yeah. great, the great scenes, blow, winds, blow. Those are the things we remember. Right. But if you had to direct this play, you would not be happy. I remember, though, uh, seeing a couple of productions and think, boy, this is getting really lumpy. But then it becomes, to my mind, the sparest of all the plays in the end. Yes. we got to wrap it up, but I am curious, since we, we really don't know that much about the man himself, but you've spent your life studying him. Can you imagine, anyway, what it would have been like to sort of go to the bar after a performance at the Globe and hung out with Shakespeare? Do you have in your own mind, have you created a Shakespeare for Jim Shapiro, your own personal version? I used to believe, and in 1599, I, I, I wrote, my book 59, I, I wrote that I, I tend to, tended to believe what early commentators in the 17th century said about Shakespeare. They went to his hometown and they said, what kind of guy was Shakespeare? And everybody they spoke to said, if you asked him to go out partying, in a sense, he said, I wasn't feeling well, leave me alone, a version of that. Mm. So that he wasn't a very sociable guy. This past year, they found something spectacular, which I was able to work into the book. Mm -hmm. They found oh. a report from the early 17th century, from the Jacobean times, that Shakespeare had gone into the Tabard Inn, not far from the Globe Theater, and carved or cut his name into the paneling uh, along with those of other uh, Richard Burbage and yeah, other yeah. Uh, actors of the time. So you get a sense, you know, it's like going to one of these bars near Broadway where you see the posters or the signatures. <laughs> Shakespeare, Sardis. <laughs> Shakespeare hung out. At Sardis. Sardis of his day. <laughs> you know, they, Sardis probably doesn't like getting out the pen knife and cutting it. <laughs> no, no. But, but that was the kind of guy he probably was in London. Maybe he put on the sour face when he went back home to uh, the provinces. And, and to the wife and the kids and the family. Exactly. But he was having a good time, you he, think, when he was in London. Which is why he always rented here and bought there. <laughs> Very good. All right. The book is The Year of Lear, Shakespeare in 1606 by our good friend James Shapiro, uh, out from Simon & Schuster. Thanks a lot for being our Thank guest. Thank you so much, Susan, Mike. Thank you. Pleasure. Now, Susan, you know I love the history of newspapers, and especially the history of uh, nightlife columnists and gossip columnists and Broadway columnists, because I sort of am the last of the Broadway columnists in New York City. Or so you think. <laughs> well, I don't see any too many no, others no, places. No, no. But one of the greats, one of the legends in my business, was uh, Leonard Lyons, who wrote a famous column for the New York Post, my newspaper, called the Lion's Den. He knew every celebrity, politician, mover, and shaker in the world. Uh, his life and his... Um, Whirly nightlife is the subject of a terrific new book, What a Time It Was, by his son, our friend Jeffrey Lyons, the film critic. 
And former theater critic. Yes, nice to, to see you. Still do theater occasionally. He was not a gossip columnist. Never wrote with his eye to the keyhole. That's why people confided in him. Ah. And he never used the word celebrity. He said, I will write about my sister Rosie in Brooklyn if she's newsworthy. And once in a while, my Tante Rosie was newsworthy. <laughs> she would and pop in the column. His column was required reading at NYU by a, by a journalism class. And Carl Sandburg said, if the column had been around during Lincoln's time, we'd really know what New York was like. Right. He was America's greatest Lincoln scholar. And of course, one night my father took him on his rounds of nightclubs. Mm -hmm. And Sherman Billingsley, not known for being a voracious reader, the <laughs> owner of the store club, said to my father, what does this guy do? My father said, well, he's America's greatest Lincoln scholar. And Billingsley said, uh, tell him to mention the store club in his next book. Will you <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, tell us, your, how did your father start out? Is, was he just a general assignment reporter no, at one no, point? No. No, As he, he once told a friend years later, mm -hmm. he started out, he went to law school, he went to City College. Mm -hmm. He's in the Hall of Fame, City College. And then he went to St. John's Law School, finished second in his class, in the first class of the law school began sending little quips and anecdotes and news items to all the columnists of the day. Walter Winchell and... Well, well not quite. Then the Daily Mirror hired Winchell. Oh. And the New York Post wanted to hire a columnist too. Right. At the same time, his law firm had wanted to transfer him to San Juan to their office in Puerto Rico. <laughs> he had met my mother. He didn't want to leave, as he told his friend. And so he won a contest, beat out 500 people to write the columns. So the friend my father told us to said, hmm, you gave up your profession for the love, of, it was the Duke of Windsor, you gave up your profession <laughs> for the love of a woman, do tell. <laughs> and he started May 20th, 1934, uh -huh. and ended May 20th, 1974, six days a week. Most people, I'm, you and I are the only ones who read the paper on Saturdays. <laughs> exactly. He wrote, if the Post published Sundays, then he would have written for Sundays too. And he wrote a thousand words a day. If he went into a restaurant in the afternoon or a nightclub at night and he saw another columnist, he'd leave. He wanted exclusive stories. Mm. What was his daily routine like? Good question. He'd get up at 1230. He, the Post was then an afternoon paper. Right, right, right. And he would read it. And sometimes, no disrespect to them, the guys in the line of type off with the, with the square hats made him. <laughs> they would yeah. sometimes have typos in the punchlines. But... He'd then go to Sardis, <laughs> yep. then 21, then Forum of the Twelve Caesars, then Voisin and, and the Grand Wee, all the fancy restaurants. Mm -hmm. And he'd start picking up stories. Lenny, come here. i got a great thing happening. He'd go down to the paper. He'd write the column, and he'd hand it in. Now, his competitors, Louis Sobel, High Gardner, Ed Sullivan, Charlie Knickerbocker, Jack O'Brien, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, yeah. the, yeah. the, the, the gossip columnists, they were finished, too, at 6 o'clock. My father would come home. We lived at 81st and Central Park West, across the street from Central Park. Mm -hmm. He'd pitch an inning or two with his four sons in that transverse area, which mm -hmm. then was only two lanes, not four. <laughs> and he'd go out again at night. <laughs> if there's Broadway opening, in the early years, it was at 8.20, not at 6 o'clock. Exactly, and then yeah. people like me on TV came along. They made it 6.30. And he'd go to a Broadway show, or he'd make rounds at night, too. Mm -hmm. And then he'd come home at 1 o'clock in the morning. The last stop was always P.J. Clark's. All right. And for like this, for an hour or two, he'd be updating stories verbatim. No facts, no word processor. Yeah. Most of the years, not an electric typewriter. To the guys on the lobster shift, as they yeah, used to call it. Call I don't think right. they still do. And <laughs> stories that couldn't wait until the next day. So he would scoop his competitors. Then from 6 till 7 in the morning, he'd write a magazine article or work on something. Then, then we'd be getting up and he'd go back to sleep and he'd do it again. So my father loved when he would see other columnists run a story, he would say to me, I printed that story two weeks ago. He <laughs> loved doing that. Did he live in a tuxedo? No, no, no. <laughs> was he all, but he must have always had a tux, several you know, tux ready to go. He was born on, <clears throat> in a slum on Rivington Street. Oh. A, so he was totally five children. Yeah. And his, his father died when he was 11. His father was a Romanian tailor, and his mother ran a candy stand where she sold cigarettes by the cigarette, in, wow. and he'd sleep under the counter. I wow. read this in a, in a, biograph, in a uh, profile of him from 1945. Mm -hmm. And he, one, when, when they, were, they were Truman's guests in the White House on their last night, and when he would take me and my brother, we, I've been on Onassis's yacht, and my father would say, you like the show so far? <laughs> Meaning I've come a long way since the Lower East Side. Exactly. And then he was admitted to practice in front of the Supreme Court in 1952. <laughs> and when he went, I remember this as a, I was a very little boy, Five of the justices were sitting, Lenny, hey, hi, you know. And meanwhile, <laughs> lawyers for upcoming cases who were going to plead their case, who is this guy? He's on a first name basis with the majority. We got to get him work for us. So he, he crammed a lot of years, a lot of lives and into 70 years. And I thought it was so interesting that he's a teetotaler. That's right. Yeah, yeah he yeah. didn't drink at all, no, and no, even though he was in this world wine. nightlife. And, and ironically, the day I counted the days I live, I've lived so far and the day my father lived and the day I passed the number of days he lived 
I heard a report, for, it's in the beginning of the book, from England, that people who work the night shift usually don't live as long. Uh, this is the second volume, by the way. In the, in the first one, yep. it's called Stories My Father Told Me. I right. just couldn't cram all the people in, so each chapter is a different person he knew well. Yep. And, and so, it's all drawn from his columns. Yes, absolutely. I had them all in scrapbooks and pulled out 1946 and opened it up and, 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 and went through. I think the stock of, uh, of Scotch tape must have gone up because I went through six. Because you're not cutting and pasting. You, you rewrite looking, chapters looking at, about the people. Looking yeah. at yeah. the columns and, and how can I put these in a mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. and how can I make them newsworthy. And I'm, most of the stories, some of the stories are dated. I don't want to do that. They refer to people that readers wouldn't know. Yeah. Well, but, our viewers know them. Well, yeah. some of them. Yeah. But in, if I had never heard of them then I knew that they were <laughs> yeah they're gone but I learned something amazing I didn't know my father ever took a vacation yeah he would travel and he would have reserve columns and he have he'd meet people at airports who he called pigeons and they would fly back and, and call a post and they pick it up but he did take off a week in 1943 and had a few interesting guest columnists write a column for him Salvador Dali <laughs> Ernest Hemingway Sinclair Lewis <laughs> Margaret Bork White <laughs> And Jimmy Durante, I, I reread the Salvador Dali column. Does it make any sense? None, none, <laughs> none at all, nor should it have. Now, some of those columnists, I mean, one thinks of, you know, the J.J. Hunsucker, Sweet Smell Success. Yeah. These guys were tough. My friends used to kid me about that movie. Yeah. yeah, vindictive, brutal guys. But I never got the sense that that was the tone your father took. They in say life. you can tell what kind of life somebody lived by where, they're, where they give their money, charitable nations, what they say when they're drunk, and how many people come to their, their funeral. A thousand people came to my father's funeral. Mm -hmm. Mayor Lindsay began his eulogy by saying, in a business of sharks, he was a prince. Mm. I only heard him speak ill of, of a few people. Uh, cool. One of them was a head of a publishing company who was on TV a lot on a panel show, who would, <laughs> who would clip my father's stories and, and, and put them in. I don't know why my father never cried foul at that. Oh, he put him in his book, his yeah, that's right. collection of do his that. anecdotes. And he didn't credit your father with no, that. No, no. And, and my father was out in January nights at one, one in the morning going from one place to another. We always knew that at 1130 he was at Sardi's. We knew right. that we knew, no pagers back then. If we needed to call him, we'd try to track his movements. <laughs> and the other, well, the other person who he, I ever heard him speak ill of was a world famous movie director, stage director, who compl who squealed to the committee and was very <laughs> controversial and all that. But other than that, you know, he knew everybody. And yeah. He was beloved. Yeah, yeah. And when, when, when did, did he die in the job or did he? Re no, he no. Well, he no, he died in 1976. He'd retired in 1974. Was there on a the moment, 40th anniversary? Right. Was there a moment there where he sort of saw the world that he loved, that he worked in, sort of passing that whole Stork Club era? No, because they were still on then. I, this, well, I needed to know. Good question. I, I needed to know what year the Stork Club closed. Mm -hmm. So I went on the internet. There's a Wikipedia. There's a photograph. And my father in the middle of the photograph talking to Tommy Manville, the asbestos guy who married 14 times. He had rice marks on him, okay? And there's Orson Welles in the picture. And it said, a typical night in the store club, 1944. I said, it had better not have been November 5th because that's the day I was born and the place was next to my mother at the hospital. <laughs> uh, in 1974, some, a lot of those places were still open. He, he covered this. They were called discotheques back then. Don't forget, oh, Arthur was, was, was Sybil oh, Burton's then, place. And, yeah, of course, of And course. Studio 54 and all those kind of places. And like Maxwell plum Maxwell, and, yeah so he yeah. moved with the time he did he absolutely didn't stay back in because he needed a younger era. audience too and he wrote about the beatles and dustin hoffman and the upcoming young actors like that and and did he just want to retire one day so that's it i didn't had want to retire if he, he if he were alive today he'd still be writing the column he'd still be right if the if they would you know it'd be harder today yeah. because there's the internet oh, there's yeah. giant flat screen tvs there's any movie ever made available at home the other the other thing i think he would find difficult although maybe he could have figured a way around it is <clears throat> These celebrities of the era, these they what? were celebrity. What are those? <laughs> oh, sorry. The, these what, prominent people, newsworthy, show, people. newsworthy people. <laughs> they were, it seems to me, in that era, more accessible to reporters and newspaper people than they are today. I mean, today you've got a, they have a phalanx of PR people. You, as you well know, doing the interviews, you have to go through layers of PR people. They, they want to approve the interviewer. They, they want to approve the questions. It was a different era. I mean, the, the, the longest chapter in the book is FDR, yeah. in this book. Second longest is Eleanor Roosevelt. The third longest is the Gabors, who were really the Kardashians of the 1950s. Yes, that's yes. a good point. Three sisters, 19 husbands. Not one of them <laughs> played in the NBA, but 19 husbands. In your father's day, the celebrities were more interesting. I mean, you're talking about Orson Welles and, and, and Ernest Hemingway, and then we get down to the to reduce to the Kardashians. <laughs> you know, but who, are, who just do nothing, are famous but, but, for being except famous. Except they keep the lights on. 
on at the E Channel, it must be said. They must <laughs> be being, being famous and successful with no talent is a talent. Yeah. In, in, yeah. Uh, I always think of your father whenever I'm at Sardi's. I was at Sardi's just yesterday, and I remember some of the old Broadway people I I know. Uh, they always remembered your father coming around from table to table to table. You got a story. One day, a story. an English actor named Albert Finney was in New York for the first time, and he saw my father doing that at Sardi's. He says, "What's that guy doing?" And he said he's table hopping, and they became good friends. And there are two pictures of my father in Sardis, two photographs, ironically, near the bar, and he didn't drink. He didn't drink. But I will tell, <laughs> end with the story of Michael Riedel, that I was sitting with our late, beloved friend, Jock LeSueur, at the back table oh, of Joe Allen. classy guy. Great guy. Yes, and we said, Michael Riedel has walked in the door. Forty minutes later, he had not made it back to our table yet. Wow! Because I was Michael Riedel. Was, <laughs> I was following your father's footsteps, <laughs> going up and down that the tables. Practice. You Finding perform the a valuable service. There's <laughs> nobody else who covers Broadway quite the way you do. Someday, long after you're going to be you're gone, there's going to be an award named for you. No. <laughs> I'm holding out for a theater, Jeffrey. Oh, <laughs> <Fred. laughs> yeah. Harvers. Harvers. The book is "What a Time It Was," uh, by Jeffrey Lyons about his father, Leonard Lyons, the great uh, New York Post nightlife columnist, the Lyons. Den. Uh, it's out from Abbeville Press. Jeffrey, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you very much. This is the second you. of two volumes. Is going to be a first, third? The first one's called Stories My Father Told Me. Right. And Marilyn Monroe is flirting with my father, who's looking at her eyes, by the way. And my <laughs> mother is over her shoulder saying, what is going on there? Taken by Sam Shaw, who took the shot of Marilyn on the subway grating. Right, of course. You know. Is it going to be a third volume? Do you have more? I mean, Maybe. There are, we'll see. There are a lot of columns to I, work I, through. I, there are. There are. Okay. Thanks a lot for being here. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.